Hello and welcome to part four of this series on human prehistory. This time we'll be looking into the origins and development of the Neolithic, and along with that, the origins of civilization. Before we get into the Neolithic itself, however, I do want to address the Lemurian question one more time. I had previously suggested that the early racial stocks of the Upper Paleolithic in Indonesia and Australia had higher Neanderthal admixture and greater intelligence than the subsequent populations, which we now take to be the indigenous populations of the region. This notion is supported by the early presence of rather sophisticated rock art, which degrades in quality over time, which suggests the degradation of some founding stock. Further evidence is found in the distribution of the boomerang, which is actually found in the Carpathian Mountains, the site of several important Upper Paleolithic developments from 30,000 years ago. European Cromanian populations undoubtedly migrated across Siberia to spread Neanderthal admixture to the Haman culture, and it looks like they also migrated into the Indonesian and Australian regions very early on. There is a megalithic site in Indonesia, Gunung Padang, which is at least 8,000 years old, but probably much older. Archaeological work is in a very early stage at Gunung Padang, and it will be interesting to discover what they find as time goes on there. The majority of the Neolithic developments that I'll be focusing on is in the Near Eastern region, but keep in the back of your mind that there is likely a Sundodontic, highly Neanderthal admixed, culturally advanced movement coming up from Indonesia, likely moving into the Indian subcontinent. Unfortunately, archaeology is not as developed in Southeast Asia and Indonesia as it is in the West. With that being said, let's turn our attention back to the Near East, circa 11,500 BC. The Natufian population previously mentioned by this time had migrated north into Syria, establishing a small settlement at Abu Huraira. The mainstream theory is that the Natufian population at Abu Huraira and similar Levantine sites had been collecting grains which grew wild in the area until 10,900 BC when the Younger Dryas began. Those wild grains began to die out. In order to survive, the populations at Abu Huraira and nearby sites likely started sowing these seeds, which led to the development of agriculture as we know it. There's evidence of the cultivation of rye at Abu Huraira from the very earliest period of the Younger Dryas. As this agricultural technology was being developed in northern Syria, the first domestication of the goat was likely happening in the Zagros mountain region to the east. And further to the north, also in Syria, from around 10,000 BC, we have Tel Caramel, which, although not a megalithic site, does boast five rather large stone towers, six meters in diameter, with walls 1.5 meters thick. This is earlier than any confirmed dating at Gobekli Tepe, but only approximately 5% of Gobekli Tepe has thus far been uncovered. So it is likely that Gobekli Tepe dates further back than 9,500 BC and predates this development at Caramel. The architecture of the towers at Caramel can be seen as a logical development from the stone walls of the Natufian semi-subterranean dwellings. The towers had hearths inside, and there's some evidence of Arak sacrifice. The artifacts at the site are of high quality, and the designs are geometric in nature. Around the same time, 10,000 BC, the site at Mazin in Ukraine also has high quality artifacts with geometric designs and features the first swastika patterns. The population at Mazin was a continuation of a long history of semi-sedentarism facilitated by their mammoth hunting lifestyle. In the frigid climate of the last ice age, mammoth meat could be stored much longer than any food procured in the south. Anyone with an interest in Egyptology will probably have heard theories that the Sphinx, or at least the body of the Sphinx, actually dates from this period around 10,000 BC. Suffice to say that our understanding of any hierarchical social structures at this period in history, which would have been capable of this early megalithic work is shoddy at best. Some of these data points, like an early date of the Sphinx, the Gunung Padang site in Indonesia, Gobekli Tepe, Tel Caramel, might be viewed in light of my Atlantean hypothesis, and there are myths from numerous cultures, not just the Greeks, which tell of a mysterious land in the West whence the mystery of immortality was first brought to the known world. One of the most interesting sites from this period, around 10,000 BC, is Kortik Tepe in Kurdistan. 
in northern Iraq. Houses were built according to a common plan at Kortik Tepe, and new houses were built on top of previous structures. The floors of the structures were earthen, and there are some very advanced artifacts at the site, including extremely advanced stone vessels, which could not have originated in the span of only a few hundred years, and which must have some predecessor in an as yet unknown culture. Once again, notions of an Atlantean influence come to mind. At this point, I'll make reference to the work of Graham Hancock. His famous Fingerprints of the Gods includes a description of numerous ancient maps which accurately depict the coasts of North and South America, and even Antarctica, as they would have been before the end of the last ice age. There are also some disputed megalithic sites which are submerged off the coast of Japan and India, which Graham Hancock has looked into, and he uses these sites to support the notion that there was a global proto-civilization, the memory of which has been lost after the comet impact which caused the Younger Dryas. Unfortunately, the site at Kortik Tepe is going to be flooded by the construction of the Ilusu Dam. The site at Abu Herrera has already been flooded by the construction of the Tabka Dam in 1974. Also flooded by the construction of the Tabka Dam was the site at Muribet. Muribet, much like Abu Herrera, developed out of a northern Natufian migrant site. The cooking pits in Muribit are outside of the structures, and the dwellings here ceased to be semi-subterranean and were built at ground level from around 9700 BC. Again, from this early Younger Dryas period, we already have evidence of the domestication of barley and rye, and we have sickle blades and grinding stones. The population at Muribit hunted gazelle and equids. Fishing was important for their economy, and they had domesticated dogs. From around 9300 BC at Murray Bet, the dwellings cease to be circular and become rectangular, and now have multiple rooms. The walls of these structures are constructed with cylindrical stones covered with earth. The hearths and cooking pits are still found outside the structures at this time. The development of rectangular architecture is associated with the spread of the pre-pottery Neolithic B phase, which, in my opinion, is likely associated with a particular warrior-priest class likely developing out of the cult of Gobekli Tepe. We'll be looking at the development of this rectangular, einkorn wheat-using, Gobekli Tepe colonizing culture as we go on. Einkorn wheat was domesticated very close to Gobekli Tepe, and is likely associated with sites directly descended from the Gobekli Tepe priest class. Muribet at this time did feature einkorn wheat. A very important development at Muribet occurred around this time, perhaps 9000 BC. They started using clay tokens for counting. This may have originated as a means of tracking debt or as a simpler tallying system. But it is safe to say that this system of clay tokens over the next 5,000 years developed into the early cuneiform system of Sumer and Elam. By 8,600 BC at Muribet, they had domesticated sheep and goat, and most likely cattle as well. Another of the very earliest Neolithic sites is Choga Golan from the foothills of the Zagros mountain region. Like Kortik Tepe, Choga Golan featured earthen buildings periodically destroyed and then rebuilt in the same location. They had groundstone tools and stone vessels like Kortik Tepe. At Choga Golan, we find sculpted clay objects, including geometric forms like cones, as well as anthroform and theriform objects. At Choga Golan, we find domesticated barley, emmer wheat, lentils, grass peas, and goats, which were originally domesticated in the region. We also have sickles and mortar and pestles. In southeastern Anatolia, confirmed 9500 BC, but likely older, we have Gobekli Tepe, which is the world's oldest known megalithic site. Gobekli Tepe consists of massive stone T-shaped pillars, each carved from a single piece of rock. They average 20 feet tall and weigh from 20 to 50 tons. There are 200 such pillars arranged in 20 circles. The stones fit into sockets cut into the bedrock. Many of the floors in these stone circles are composed of terrazzo, an early form of cement. Recall from my Atlantean hypothesis video that the Bosnian Pyramid of the Sun, which I claimed was an Atlantean site, is lined with concrete. The earliest constructions at Gobekli Tepe are larger than those subsequent. 
the earlier pre-pottery Neolithic A layers at Gobekli Tepe are larger than the subsequent pre-pottery Neolithic B layers, which feature rectangular rooms. The pillars most likely represent humans, or gods, as many of the pillars have arms which wrap around their front. In these stone circles, there are usually two in the center, which suggest imagery of a gateway. It should be obvious at this point that there are several sites from the Younger Dryas period around the Near East. One explanation for the development of sophisticated hierarchical social systems at this time is that the Younger Dryas brought about climatic changes in Europe and the Sahara, which likely forced groups from these regions into a narrow belt around the Fertile Crescent, which had a forest steppe ecology at this time. Most of the people who watch this channel will understand that there are differences in intelligence between different racial groups, and this appears to have been key to the development of the Neolithic and civilization. It's very possible that some late Magdalenian population, or a population from the Western Russian steppes, moved into Southeast Anatolia and brought a variation of the old European shamanism to the region using the spirituality to control the labor of the local Natufian population. It's worth repeating that the Natufian population originally had more Nordic features, and over time, likely due to admixture with sub-Saharan populations, they approached a more gracile Mediterranean type. The effect of such an admixture would likely have been a reduction in intelligence. And if such an admixture was actually orchestrated by some hieratic group, then this would set the precedent for trends which have continued and which persist into the present day. Despite the ambiguous origins of some cultures from this Younger Dryas period, after the establishment of Gobekli Tepe, the dissemination of Neolithic technologies seems to have been much more straightforward. Neolithic technologies were basically exported as a package from what seems to have originally been one central priest class. Near Gobekli Tepe, we have Navali Chori, which features einkorn wheat. Navali Chori was flooded by the Ataturk Dam in 1991. You may be noticing a pattern here, and so have I. My suspicion is that there are forces at work which do not want us to have a clear picture of the origins of the Neolithic. Perhaps because if we knew those origins, we would see that the technologies of social engineering employed then are still being employed now and likely by the same bloodlines. The artifacts and architecture at Navali Chori are similar to those found at Muribet, and in my opinion were likely introduced from Navali Chori, from the Gobekli Tepe and priest class, to late Natufian groups. Navali Chori featured long rectangular houses with several rooms and antechambers. These rectangular houses were placed on top of stone strips which created open-air channels which facilitated cooling, which likely kept out rodents and other creatures. The development of this channeled architecture may have allowed for large-scale storage of grain, and therefore expansion of hierarchical social structures. At Navali Chori, there is a large cult complex cut into the hillside that features terrazzo floors, like those found at Gobekli Tepe. T-shaped pillars, like those found at Gobekli Tepe, were built into the walls in this cult complex. There's an interesting statue with a snake winding up the spine and up the top of the head. Anyone familiar with the symbology of the Kundalini in Tantra will see similarities. And those familiar with the Hermetic tradition and the Caduceus will also see similarities. Clay figurines at Navali Chori were fired at temperatures between 500 and 600 degrees Celsius, which was a considerable technological achievement for the time. There were likely several ethnic and even racial groups present in the Fertile Crescent during this time period. We have the Koroan culture from 10,600 BC to 6,900 BC, which is often termed the Heavy Neolithic, which used larger Levalois tools than those found in the sphere of Gobekli Tepe. Several of the sites of the Karoran culture have been destroyed by the construction of housing developments or by flooding by the construction of dams. There's evidence of advanced hierarchical social structures in Jordan at Wadi Fainan. There's a large 4,500 square foot oval shaped building. It appears to have been built by digging a pit and then lining the walls with a very strong mud mixture. A floor was constructed from mud plaster and surrounded by two tiers of benches, three feet deep and one and a half feet high, recalling an amphitheater. Post holes indicate that a roof covered a section of the structure. It was likely in use from 9600 BC 
to 8200 BC. The farmers in this region cultivated wild barley, pistachio, and fig trees. They also hunted or herded wild goats, cattle, and gazelle. They did have groundstone tools. There are two separate villages, one using pre-pottery Neolithic A technologies, the other using pre-pottery Neolithic B technologies. The dates overlap for these two villages in the same area. To the north from 9500 BC, we have Jerf el Amar, which was unfortunately flooded by the construction of the Tishrin Dam in 1999. They farmed chickpeas, einkorn wheat, barley, lentils. They hunted equines, gazelles, aurochs, and birds. They had obsidian sourced from the Cappadocian region. Villages were built on terraces or arranged around a square where a buried communal building was located. The houses on these terraces were often connected with a retaining wall built into the hill. Later levels were not terraced and surround large circular mausoleums. The later levels are more variable in architecture than the earlier ones, indicating that the site was founded as a colony by one homogenous culture and later developed organically several different traditions. There are pictographs from Jerf el Amar, and it has been claimed even perhaps a form of early proto-writing. Early proto-writing has also been suggested from the Magdalenian period in Europe. I'll present those forms here and allow you to determine whether you think this may constitute proto-writing. Around this same time, around 9000 BC, in North America, the Clovis culture had been wiped out by the comet impact in the Northeast. But in the West, their descendants developed into the Folsom industry. And we have petroglyphs from Winnemucca Lake in Nevada from 8500 BC. From 9400 BC, we have a small village at Jericho. The nearby Ain es Sultan Spring was frequented by the Natufians. The first stone structures were built at Jericho from around 9000 BC. At this time, Jericho may have had a population between 2000 and 3000, which is considerable for the time period. Between 8300 BC and 7800 BC, the famous tower and wall of Jericho were constructed. The wall was 12 feet high and 6 feet wide. The tower was 12 feet high. At Jericho, they farmed emmer wheat, barley, and legumes. In the Jordan Valley, at Iraq ed Dub, the Cave of the Bear, from 10,000 BC, we have early barley domestication. There's a natural rock shelter atop a forested hill in which there are built stone structures. These structures featured mud floors, mud bricks, and underfloor burials, which are common in Neolithic sites in the following millennia. The relatively small population at Iraq ed Dub used einkorn wheat. This, in my opinion, may represent an outpost of the Gobekli Tepin priest stock, and this southern outpost may have influenced later developments in Jordan and in Palestine. From at least 8200 BC, but perhaps as far back as 9000 BC, we have a Sikli Hoyuk in central Anatolia next to a major obsidian source. The male population at Asikli Hoyuk lived up to 57 years old, whereas the female population rarely grew past the age of 25. The female skeletons show spinal deformities consistent with bearing heavy loads. There was a 43% infant mortality rate. My interpretation of Asikli Hoyuk is an obsidian gathering work camp established by the Navali Chori Gobekli Tepin priest caste. There are underfloor burials at Asikli Hoyuk, including all ages and both sexes, but they were likely a prerogative of the elite, as only a portion of the rooms at Asikli Hoyuk contained hearths, and those rooms containing hearths were much more likely to contain underfloor burials. The structures at Asikli Hoyuk were periodically destroyed and then rebuilt in exactly the same orientation. Even the hearths are on precisely the same location as the previous structure. The houses at Asikli Hoyuk were clustered in neighborhoods with two to six dwellings around courtyards which may have been a common space for labor or leisure. The average room size was 12 square meters, and there's no evidence of doors in the walls. So like the later Kadal Hoyuk, the entrances to these structures were likely on the roofs. At Asikli Hoyuk, there are some larger buildings without hearths, which were up to 500 square meters and had interior courtyards. The walls were thicker on these buildings than the residential structures. There are no obvious storage bins at the site and surprisingly few burials. It's possible that the labor for this site 
was sourced from other villages and that this site did not function as a permanent residence for those working here, but perhaps only as a permanent residence for the elites, which controlled the ceremonies in the common building and were buried under floor. Near Mount Carmel at Naho Oren, there seems to have been an aborted gazelle domestication attempt. This domestication attempt did not spread to other sites and subsequent lairs at Nahal Oren feature domesticated goats. From 9500 BC, we have the pre-pottery Neolithic A at Tel Aswad, which is similar to other Syrian post-Natufian sites. From 8700 BC, we have the pre-pottery Neolithic B layer, which features large earthen architecture and obsidian sourced from Anatolia. There are clay features of people, animals, and geometric forms like spheres, cones, and discs. The earliest burials are in the home and later in cemeteries outside the village. The deceased were allowed to decompose, after which their skulls were removed, cleaned, and then plastered and painted. This may suggest a cult of ancestor worship, which you would expect in a society originated by a priest caste which likely styled themselves as semi-divine or divine. In Sumer, the legends of the Anunnaki gods indicate that they come from a mountain to the northwest, which in my opinion betrays a faint memory of the semi-divine priesthood of Gobekli Tepe. At Tel Aswad, they had domesticated emmer wheat from 8800 BC. They had fruit such as figs, they had pistachios, flax seeds. They had domesticated goats, pigs, sheep, and cattle. The cattle show disease resulting from use in labor. There's also evidence of continued hunting and fishing. Around 9000 BC, we have the first seasonal camps at Napta Playa, which many consider to be the beginnings of what will become the Egyptian culture. From 9000 BC, we have very rare early African pottery, the source of which is unknown. From 7000 BC at Napta Playa, there are large permanent settlements and large deep wells. Small huts at this time are arranged in straight lines. From 6800 BC, they begin making pottery locally, but by this time, pottery was a common technology in the Near East. At Napta Playa, around 6500 BC, there was a large drought, and settlement was interrupted. The group which subsequently settled the area had complex social systems, they sacrificed cows, and they erected large, unshaped stones in circles, likely used as solar calendars. Around 6100 BC at Napta Playa, they had sheep and goats from the Near East, and the site became a major regional religious center. At this time, there are complex stone structures, buried megaliths with stone circles above. Nearby, there are indications of cattle sacrifices. Anyone with a knowledge of engineering may want to look at the complex buried megaliths at Napta Playa from this period to discover if there may have been some functional purpose in mind. Around 8500 BC, we have the first domestication events in South America. The Guitarero Cave in Peru features the ahi pepper, the oca, ahi, the common bean, the paler bean, the oluco, the zapolo, and maize, which appears around 6200 BC. Similar proto-domestication events likely occurred in Southeast Asia around the same time. And it's interesting that around the world, different crops are beginning to be domesticated at just about the same time, although the earliest evidence does come from the Near East. From 8500 BC, we have the beginnings of agriculture in Northeast China. There's evidence of millet cultivation, and they did have grinding stones. They also continued to use pottery, which had been known in China and Japan for the last 10,000 years. The millet cultivation was found at Nanzhuang Tao. Further to the south, the first rice domestication appears from around 8000 BC. The eastern trend towards greater collectivism and the western trend towards greater individualism has been hypothesized to originate from the differences in rice and wheat cultivation. Rice domestication requires greater collective labor, whereas wheat can successfully be grown and harvested by a single family. Around 7000 BC, a site was flooded in the Gulf of Kambat in northwest India. This reflects descriptions of a sacred city off the coast found in the Mahabharata. In recent years, archaeology has consistently confirmed many of the legends of the Mahabharata. If the archaeology from the Gulf of Kambat does reflect a genuine site, 
then we would certainly be missing a large portion of the history of civilization from the Indian subcontinent. Recall at this time that there was megalithic work in Indonesia from at least 6000 BC at Gunung Padang. My guess is that the great acceleration of technological exchange leading to the Sumerian civilization was a result of westward movement from the Lemurian sphere and eastward movement from the Atlantean sphere. And for those interested in the history of phenotypes, around 8000 BC in the northwestern Black Sea region, the common ancestor of all modern blue-eyed people lived according to recent genetic studies. 8000 BC is also the time when Gobekli Tepe was backfilled. The purpose of the backfilling of Gobekli Tepe is certainly mysterious. It may be that the original priest caste was broken, or it may be that they persisted but simply wished to move on to a new mythic framework. It's interesting that the Age of Leo lasted from 10,500 BC to 8,000 BC, and there has been a large degree of correspondence throughout history between the changing of the astrological ages and major shifts in world mythology. Which brings up an interesting question, how the ancients understood the process of astronomical precession, which requires thousands of years of observation and advanced mathematics to understand. There's evidence of knowledge of the phenomenon of precession from even the earliest periods of the earliest civilization, Sumer. From 7,500 BC, we have what has been called the first city in the world, Kadalhayuk, with a possible population somewhere between 5 and 10,000. There are no obvious public buildings at Kadalhayuk. Some rooms are larger and do feature murals, but these are also private dwellings. The houses are clustered together and there are no streets. The entrances were from the rooftop, and people likely traveled across this network of connected rooftops. The interior walls were plastered, and most units did have cooking hearths and ovens. There were usually two rooms in a structure, and it seems that they were kept very clean. Underfloor burials were common, although there is evidence of a period of exposure of the corpses. And like similar Near Eastern practices, the heads were removed, cleaned, and plastered. Echoes of this practice may be seen as late as Roman antiquity, when the patrician families continued the practice of death masks. There were large murals on both the internal and external walls. In some buildings, there were cattle heads mounted on the wall. Unlike other sites from this period, there is no obvious hierarchy at Kadalhayuk, and men and women had roughly equal nutrition. At Kadalhayuk, we have the first historical example of the goddess statue with flanking lions, a motif which will reappear for several thousand years in the Mediterranean region. Most statues at Kadalhayuk are of animals, about 5% are female fertility figurines. Around 7,500 BC, in the extreme southwest of Anatolia, there is another Neolithic site, Sagalassos. I could not find description of this site, but it ties into a theory that I've had that the population Kadalhayuk represents a population which had been freed from the hieratic order dominant further to the east. Perhaps a workers' revolt at a Sikli Hoyuk could have brought about the population which founded Kadalhayuk using architectural techniques similar to those found at Asikli Hoyuk. Also around 7,500 BC in north central India, we have Birana, which has potter's kilns, an elaborate drainage system, granaries, ritualistic platforms, and terracotta figurines. Like I said before, archaeology from Southeast Asia and Indonesia is not as developed as archaeology of the Near East. So what we find at Birana in north central India may reflect a western migration of the Lemurian sphere. Also around 7500 BC, we have the first Neolithic site in Greece, Sesclo. The population at Sesclo was likely a migrant population from Anatolia, and on the Cycladic island of Milos, at the Frankthi cave, we have what is likely a Paleolithic population, which starts to imitate the agricultural techniques of the Anatolian migrants. Cattle found at Sesclo likely came from Kadalhoyuk or some other Anatolian site. The population at Sesclo grew over the next 2,500 years to 5,000 individuals. Villages were built on hillsides near fertile valleys. They had wheat, barley, sheep, goats, swine, and dogs. Their houses had one or two rooms, and the rooms were mud brick or wood. Later on, houses were standardized, built of adobe on stone foundations and often had two floors. The late development of standardization supports my hypothesis 
that Kalohayuk and Western Anatolian sites resulted from a breakaway from the hieratic order of the Near East. By 5000 BC, we have the first urbanization in Greece. The Seslo culture gave rise to the Poridan culture in Macedonia around 6500 BC and may have given rise to the Karanova culture of Bulgaria. They also gave rise to the Starshevo culture of 6000 BC, which developed the Koros and Chris cultures of Eastern Hungary and Romania from 5800 to 5300 BC. The Sesklo culture may thus be seen as the origin of Maria Gimbutas's Old Europe complex. Also by 7500 BC, we have Neolithic settlements in southwest Iran, like the one at Ali Kosh. These will later develop into the early Elamite civilization. In northwest Jordan, around 7,250 BC, we have Ain Ghazal, which has cereals, legumes, chickpeas, and domesticated goats. Some dead were buried under floor, others in the surrounding terrain. The majority were simply disposed of. There are some particularly interesting statues at this site with two heads. Whether these artifacts were a product of imagination, or whether some incidence of conjoined twins was involved, is an interesting question. From 7200 BC, we have Cheyenu in southeastern Turkey. Cheyenu may be the site of both pig domestication and cattle domestication. They had both emmer and einkorn wheat. The site has features from both pre-pottery Neolithic A and pre-pottery Neolithic B. There are also two-headed statues at Cheyenu. Cheyenu has large stone rectangular buildings built in a grid and evidence of human sacrifice so a strong hierarchical element is clearly evident. The priesthood at Cheyenu may represent the inheritor of the Gobekli Tepin priest caste. There are terrazzo floors, and large buildings include channels in the floors, which were probably for blood from sacrifices. The major center of sacrifice at the site occurred in what is called the Skull Building. This structure was 7 meters by 7.9 meters in size and had a round asp at one end. In two small antechambers, archaeologists unearthed roughly 295 skulls. A large chamber was also discovered that contained a one-ton cut and polished stone block, which, along with the discovery of a large flint knife, makes it almost certain that the stone acted as an offering table. Microscopic analysis of the altar stone's smooth surface revealed a high residue of blood that was found to come from aurochs, sheep, and human beings. It's interesting that there is blood from an extinct cattle species on this altar. Cheyenu was the main producer of beads in the Near East and did produce some early copper beads. Around 7200 BC, we have Choga Bonut and Choga Mish, which were large population centers around the Karun River, which would later develop into the Proto-Elamite civilization. At these sites, we have a succession from clay tokens, like those found at Muribet, to clay tablets, and eventually to cuneiform. It is not known whether cuneiform originated in the Mesopotamian sphere or in the Proto-Elamite sphere. Around 7100 BC, we have Jusi in north-central India, which had early Indian rice production. 7000 BC, the Neolithic begins on Crete, using wattle and daub architecture. They had sheep, goats, and pigs. Sometime prior to Crete, we have a settlement on Cyprus, a large fortified settlement known as Kirokitia, which had round buildings and some domed roofs. There were likely 300 to 600 people living at this site. The men were 5 feet 3 inches tall on average. Women were 4 feet 11 inches tall on average. The infant mortality was high, and the average age was around 35. The dead were buried under floor at the settlement. There is some evidence of domesticated pigs on Cyprus from as early as 11,400 BC, which, if this is true, requires some form of Atlantean explanation. At 7,350 BC, a large monolith was constructed in the Strait of Sicily, weighing 16 tons. The purpose of this monolith is unknown, and it predates any known Neolithic settlements on Sicily. 7000 BC, in China, we have the Pilegon culture, with no obvious evidence of strict hierarchy. They farmed millet, pigs, cattle, and poultry. They had nets made from hemp, and semi-subterranean houses, usually one room, sometimes with additional rooms added on. At the Jiahu site, we have the Jiahu symbols, which seem to be the precursor to the Oracle Bone script, which is likely the precursor to the Chinese system of writing. 7000 BC, we also have Mergar in Pakistan, which is a very advanced Neolithic site, 
it is the precursor to the Indus Valley civilization. The dental patterns at Merigar were Sundadont, meaning that the majority of the population had migrated from the east and not from the west, although the technologies used at Merigar seem to have originated primarily from the west. They farmed wheat, barley, and they herded sheep, goats, and cattle. The initial layers at Merigar do not feature pottery. They used mud buildings with four internal subdivisions. The Kambat archaeology, as well as Merigar, indicate that there is likely precursor developments in the Indian subcontinent of which we currently have no knowledge. Burials at Mergar do feature goods, and there are more goods in male burials. Trade is evinced with Afghanistan in the form of lapis lazuli and with the Gulf Coast. Mergar does feature ground stone axes, and intriguingly forms the earliest proto-dentistry, with teeth drilling, a feature shared in common with the Indus Valley civilization. The Neolithic population of Mergar moved to the southeast to form the Indus Valley civilization, whereas the Caucolithic population that replaced them likely originated from the north. Some of the earliest pottery in the Near East is found at Jarmo from 7090 BC in northern Iraq. Jarmo is found 800 meters above sea level in oak and pistachio woodlands. There were 25 dwellings and probably around 150 people. There are shells from the Persian Gulf. Their baskets are waterproofed with pitch. They had emmer and einkorn wheat, with domesticated goat, sheep, and dogs. Around 6700 BC in China, we have Banpo, a settlement which is surrounded by a moat. They had circular semi-subterranean houses, like preceding Chinese cultures. The moat is an interesting feature, and may indicate early conflict with the northern Mongol population. From 6100 BC to 5100 BC, we have the Halaf culture, which spans from southeastern Turkey to Syria and northern Iraq the same geographic extent of the majority of the early Neolithic developments. They had circular domed structures with rectangular antechambers, indicating a possible influence from Cyprus. They had dryland farming with little or no irrigation. They used emmer wheat, barley, and flax. They had domesticated cattle, sheep, and goats. They were replaced by the Ubayad culture. Around 6400 BC, we have the beginning of the Cardium pottery culture, which spread westward across the Mediterranean. It's named after the mollusk shell, which is imprinted on their distinctive pottery. The first evidence of the Cardium pottery culture is in the Greek mainland. It is distinct from the culture of Sesclo. By 6100 BC, it reaches Dalmatia. By 6000 BC, it reaches Italy. And by 5500 BC, it reaches Spain. The Cardium pottery culture was obviously seafaring, and it planted colonies as it went. In the lands to the north of the Black Sea, starting around 6300 BC, we have the Bug Dneister culture, which brought pottery to Eastern Europe from the Lake Baikal region. They also adopted agricultural techniques from the Chris and Kuros cultures to their southwest. They farmed emmer and einkorn wheat. By this time, however, the presence of einkorn wheat does not likely indicate the presence of some Gobekli Tepin priest class. The development of agriculture and pottery in the Bug Dneister region does not reflect the invasion of populations from abroad and the bugged Neister culture was one of the few autochthonous European developments from the Mesolithic to the Neolithic. Around 6300 BC, the city of Yumuktepe was formed in Anatolia, which was a typical Neolithic package colonization event, which lasted over 6,000 years, and it was finally abandoned during the Byzantine Empire. During antiquity, many of the world's oldest cities existed in Anatolia. From 6000 BC in the South Caucasus region, in modern-day Georgia, Azerbaijan, and the Armenian highlands, we have the Shulaveri Shomu culture, which featured obsidian tools, cattle, pigs, the typical Neolithic package of crops, and they were the first to domesticate the grape around 6000 BC. Wine appears in Persia shortly thereafter. The Shulaveri Shomu culture used pottery, had female figurines, and featured long prismatic obsidian blades. The Shulaveri Shomu led to the subsequent Kura Araxis culture. There is somewhat of a gap between the earliest megalithic work at Gobekli Tepe and the later megalithic work of the Western Mediterranean, which begins again around 6000 BC in Portugal with the Almendres Cromlech megaliths. These are large stones arranged in concentric circles. 
The culture to develop this megalithic technology used the La Almagra pottery, whose source is uncertain. They already had cereals and legumes, and this culture is the first to produce dolmens. There is no easy way to account for the Western European megalithic age. Also around 6000 BC, the Northern Nile Valley is beginning to be cleared. We have the Fayum A culture, which was probably produced by Near Eastern migrants, with some Saharan pastoralist influence. By 5000 BC, we have the Marimda culture in the Western Nile Delta. 4400 BC, the Badarian culture, which traded as far as Nubia and Syria. The Badarian culture founded Nekin, which is also known as Hierakompolis, which boasted the earliest zoo in the world and had large, elaborate burials. The subsequent Gerza culture of 3500 BC also had large burials and a wide trade network. Also 6000 BC, we have the Hasuna culture, who were farmers of northern Mesopotamia. They mostly lived in small villages. At Tel Hasuna, they had dwellings around central courts and some of the most sophisticated pottery in the area. They still used rainfall agriculture and have the first evidence of stamp seals. Around 5500 BC, we have the Samara culture, with two Rs, which probably came into the Near East through Tel Shamshara in the Zagros region which was located strategically, giving control of nearby trade routes. A 14-inch obsidian dagger was found at Tel Shemshara. The Samara pottery was relatively uniform and extremely widespread. The culture is known for its fine pottery decorated with stylized animals, including birds and geometric designs on dark backgrounds. The first irrigation in the world occurred in the Samaran culture at Choga Mami, which had a guard tower at the entrance. They had domesticated cattle, sheep, goats, wheat, barley, and flax. Some of the pottery of the Samara culture features swastikas. And I'm curious, given the geometric designs, swastikas, and stylized animals, whether this Samara culture was not a migrant from the steppe region. It's important to note that at this time, 5500 BC, the Bosphorus Strait broke and the Black Sea flooded, turning from fresh water to salt water. The majority of the flooding of the Black Sea occurred along the northwestern coast. It's been hypothesized that the Black Sea deluge is the origin for many of the world's flood myths. The Germanic figure of Manus, the Indian figure of Manu, may reflect an actual historical figure who led an Aryan people away from its flooded homeland into a new promised land, perhaps entering the Near East around Mount Ararat. From 5300 BC to 3800 BC, we have the Ubayid culture, which occurs first in southern Mesopotamia. It may originate with the Eridu phase from 5400 BC in southern Mesopotamia, which had connections to the Samara culture. They practiced agriculture in a dry environment due to the irrigation technologies developed by the Samara. Agriculture was facilitated in the southern Mesopotamian region by the high water table, which made drilling wells much easier. They had unwalled settlements with mud brick rectangular houses and large public architecture. There seems to be evidence of increasing social stratification. Recall that I mentioned the cohabitation of multiple racial types in a given area has led in several instances, such as the Indus Valley civilization, the Egyptian civilization, and such as the Sumerian civilization to a very strong hierarchy. This is due to the intrinsic intelligence differences between ethnic types. There was in the Ubayid period a tripartite social division between intensive subsistent peasant farmers with crops and animals coming from the north, tent-dwelling nomadic pastoralists dependent upon their herds, and a hunter-fisher folk of the Arabian littoral living in reed huts. The descendants of these hunter-fisher folk can still be found in the southern Mesopotamian region. The Ubayid period features the first evidence of sailing. Around 5700 BC in the Old European complex, we have the beginnings of the comparatively advanced Vincha culture, which grew out of the Koros, Chris, and Starchevo cultures. The Vincha featured the first copper metallurgy. There was copper mining at Rudna Glava. There is a population explosion under the Vincha culture, with some settlements reaching up to 8,200 people. They used obsidian and likely used spondylus shells as currency. They had cattle-driven plows, and cattle became more important during this period than goat or sheep. There is, however, little evidence of strong social hierarchy, resulting in little specialization. The Vinci culture may therefore be considered a craft culture, rather than an artisan culture. The famous
famous Vincha symbols are not only found in the Vincha territory, but also into the Kukateni Tripoli territory to the north. Their function and meaning may have been similar to the Scandinavian runes, but they undoubtedly predate cuneiform. Around 5500 BC, in the Middle Volga region, we have the Samara culture with one R. This is likely the culture that began horse domestication and is one candidate for the identity of the Proto-Indo-Europeans. They had individual burials in low earthen mounds or stone cairns. They had animal sacrifice and cattle, sheep, and horse. And I found it interesting that the first cheese making in the world occurred in Poland around 5500 BC at Kujui. Also around 5500 BC, we have the Linear Pottery Culture, which spreads the old European complex of Southeast Europe across the rest of the European continent to the west. It occurs early on in Western Hungary, Southern Germany, Austria, the Czech Republic, Bohemia, Moravia, and Hungary. They had long houses and used slash and burn agriculture. They also probably used the spondylus shell as currency. The people of the linear pottery culture were of the Mediterranean type, and the movement of Mediterranean peoples was halted in the middle of the Hungarian plain, with no obvious geographic cause, indicating territorial division along racial lines between the Cromanian population and the Near Eastern migrants. There does seem to have been an extensive network of trade between Cromanian and Mediterranean groups. The mtDNA haplogroups of these Mediterranean people were similar to those of modern-day Europeans. However, the Y-DNA of the linear pottery culture was predominantly H, which is rarely found in Europe today and is mostly found in India. Modern-day European Y-haplotypes descend predominantly from Cromanian and steppe populations. The linear pottery culture farmed emmer and einkorn wheat, the pea, lentils, and limited barley, millet, and rye. They had domesticated cattle, goats, swine, and dogs. They also had hemp and poppies, indicating possible early drug use. The linear pottery culture essentially spread to all available agricultural lands in mainland Europe. Their burials were a combination of underfloor and outside the village cemeteries, similar to the practices of the Near East. About 30% of graves had grave goods. There is evidence of warfare during the linear pottery culture period. Around 5000 BC in Germany, we have the Talheim Death Pit, which contains 34 skeletons with adz wounds, the adz being similar to an axe, in skulls, arrow wounds, and no defensive wounds, indicating that the slaughtered population may have been fleeing. The slaughtered people were of the Mediterranean type. There's also the Schletz Osbarn mass burial in Austria from 5500 BC, which was probably a genocide as there are more men than women in this mass grave. There is also the Herxheim mass grave, which contains 450 individuals, although here the placing of the skulls is organized, indicating a possibly recurrent ritual sacrifice. On the frontier of the linear pottery culture, or LBK culture, we find fortified sites, which may have been designed to keep the Mesolithic Cromanian population at bay. The modern-day populations most similar to the linear pottery culture people are Ashkenazi Jews, the Maltese, and Sicilians. Also around 5500 BC, the first pottery appears in the Amazon basin. Ceramics in South America move north along the east coast and then down the west coast. 5250 BC, we have the Hamangia culture of Romania and Bulgaria, which was possibly a later Anatolian settlement. They had very sophisticated ceramic art, rectangular rooms, wattle and daub architecture, stone foundations. Their settlements were situated in grids and mostly located on the coasts and river terraces. Around 5000 BC, there is the Hamudu culture in China, which is of an Austronesian and not Mongoloid stock, with large-scale rice plantations, stilt houses, and longhouses. Also around 5000 BC, the city of Uruk was founded, which would later grow to up to 40,000 people. This marks the beginning of the network of Mesopotamian city-states, which each had their own protector gods, although they shared a common mythological framework. Also 5000 BC, there is the Metzamor Stone Circle in Armenia. It is my belief that the history of Armenia during this time period, especially 6000 to 5000 BC, is extremely important for Indo-European studies. I do intend to cover Indo-Europeans later on in a separate project. Around 4900 BC, we have the Gosek Circle in Germany, which marks the sunrise and sunset on the solstice days. 
4850 BC, we have the multi-megalithic temples at Scorba. Also 4850 BC, the megalithic cairns and barrows in Brittany and Poitou in western France. 5000 BC, we have the Sredni Stog culture, which has burials like that of the Kukateni Tripillion culture, which I'll discuss momentarily. The Sredni Stog culture features axes and horse cheek pieces, indicating domestication and riding by at least 4000 BC. Also 5000 BC, the Kvalins culture succeeded the Steppe Samara culture, with individual burials, continued animal sacrifice, and further development of the Kurgan. They had metal jewelry, many of their very sophisticated stone artifacts, were later made in the same forms in metal. 4800 BC, we have the Kukateni Tripillion culture in the western Ukrainian region. The Kukateni Tripillion culture existed at a crossroads, being influenced by the Bugsneister, Srednistog, Kvilinsk, Samara, Vinsha, and linear pottery cultures. The Kukateni Tripillion culture originated in the Prut Siret region, in the eastern foothills of the Carpathian Mountains, and spread across Moldova, western Ukraine, and northeast Romania. They had very high-density small settlements, spaced about three to four kilometers apart. There are 3,000 known sites from this culture, which are primarily located in the Siret, Prut, and Dniester river valleys. The Kukateni Tripillion culture had the largest settlements in Europe at the time, and some of the largest settlements in the world, with some sites hosting up to 46,000 inhabitants, the settlements being surrounded by multiple defensive ditches. They had periodic destruction of their settlements, which had 60 to 80 year lifetimes. New settlements were reconstructed on top of old settlements, preserving the shape and orientation of older buildings, much like the earlier Anatolian settlements previously discussed. In the early period of the Kukateni Tripillion culture, their houses were semi-subterranean. Later on, they were above ground and often made largely from clay. The mutations for blonde hair and blue eyes occurred in the western Ukrainian region, and the large populations of the Kukateni Tripillion culture probably aided the spread of these phenotypes. I myself was under the impression that the warlike Yamna culture was the one that spread blonde hair and blue eyes, but it looks like it was actually a settled agricultural people who provided the main roots of this stock. The Yamna culture was primarily Y-DNA haplotype R1b, apparently had dark hair and eyes, and slightly darker skin tones than modern Europeans. I'll discuss the origins of the Yamna culture briefly. To the south of the Kukateni Tripoli culture, from 4700 BC to 3950 BC, we have the Gumalnita Karanova culture in Bulgaria and Romania. They had high quality ceramic art and some degree of work specialization. The Varna culture was a regional variant which developed around 4400 BC, which had elite male burials. 4350 BC in Azerbaijan, we have the very important Leyla Tepe culture, which probably gave rise to the Makop culture, which is also very important, which I'll discuss in a moment. The Leyla Tepe culture of Azerbaijan was the first to produce bronze tools, and was therefore the initiator of the Bronze Age. Their dead were buried mostly in ceramic vessels, which were covered by kurgans or barrows. They had mud brick houses which were tightly packed together. The origins of the Leyla Tepe culture are not certain, but they may lie to the east in Persia. Around 4300 BC, we have the funnel beaker culture along the Baltic, which had mixed Neolithic and Mesolithic technology. They featured megaliths, they used a rotating fields technique like the later Germanics, they had large stone tombs, moats, and earthworks. According to genetic evidence, the population of the funnel beaker culture was lactose tolerant and probably non-Indo-European. And 3700 BC, the Makop culture in the Western Caucasus region. All settlements of the Makop culture followed a similar plan with central oval courtyards with roads moving out like spokes. They had Kurgan burials, animal style art, an art style which is ancestral to the Scythians, Sarmatians, Celts, etc. They used an undeciphered system of petroglyphs. They were sedentary. They used horses, but these were just a small portion of their livestock, which mostly consisted of pigs and cattle. They had bronze cheek pieces, indicating that they did ride horses, or use horses to pull their wagons, of which there is evidence by 3500 BC, the first evidence in the world of such. Their agriculture was done on large mountain terraces, 
these terraces are still in existence. This terraced system of agriculture occurs thousands of years before the famous terraced agriculture of China. The first bronze sword occurs around 3700 BC in this culture, also the oldest column and the oldest stringed instrument. I'm struck by how many classical features seem to have originated in the South Caucasus region. Domesticated grapes, column architecture, and stringed instruments. Around 3650 BC, we have Minoan Crete, for which there is ample evidence, and I would encourage anyone not familiar to go ahead and watch one of the many documentaries which you can find on the topic. 3500 BC, we have Urkesh in northeast Syria, which was probably ethnically Hurrian. Also 3500 BC, we have the aforementioned Yamna culture, which has been taken by some to be the Proto-Indo-European homeland, although I myself favor the Samara culture of 5500 BC. The genetic composition of the Yamna culture was about half Siberian mammoth hunter and half Caucasus hunter-gatherer. The preceding Leila Tepe and Makop cultures were most likely the ancestors of the elite male population of the Yamna, the Yamna took the bronze and wagon technology of the Maykop, along with the horses of the steppe, and used this to spread westward into the territory of the Kukateni Tripilian culture. The swarthier Yamna culture mixed with the fairer Kukateni Tripoli culture, and this gave rise to the pastoralist, perhaps more warlike, globular amphora culture, which spread the Indo-European languages to the Germanics and to the southwest to the Greek world. 3400 BC, we have the Kura Araxis culture, which occurs earliest around Mount Ararat, and there is evidence of trade contact with Uruk. Their metal goods were widely distributed, but their craftsmanship was less sophisticated than the metalworking of the previous Leila Tepe culture. The Kura Araxis worked copper, arsenic, silver, gold, tin, and bronze. They had wheeled vehicles and occasionally built kurgans. They were eventually conquered by the Yamna. 3300 BC, we have the Afanasevo culture of South Siberia, which is genetically identical to the Yamna, meaning they were largely Y-DNA haplotype R1b, which was present in low frequencies throughout the Near Eastern Neolithic and featured darker hair and darker eyes than later Indo-European peoples who spread into Siberia, like the Andronovo culture. 2800 BC to 1800 BC, we have the Bell Beaker culture, which may have been an Indo-European culture, but was almost definitely a trading culture in Western Europe. Their characteristic beakers likely held beer and mead, which was then being introduced to the Western European region. The beakers were also used in the smelting process and sometimes as funerary urns. The origins of the Bell Beaker culture are not certain. Some posit an Indo-European origin, other hypotheses include the Tagus estuary in Portugal as a homeland. Their dead were buried with weapons, usually copper daggers, and often under tumuli. Around 2300 BC, we have the Bactria Margiana archaeological complex, which had contact with the pastoralist steppe people, as well as the settled Indus Valley civilization of the south. The BMAC, as it's known, has been hypothesized as the homeland of the prophet Zoroaster. 2300 BC, we have the Unitice culture, which is ancestral to the Celts and other European groups. You can look into the Unitice culture for yourself, but that would belong more properly in a project on the Indo-Europeans, which I do intend to do at some point. 2100 BC, we have the Andronovo culture, which originates with Sintashta, the men of which belonged primarily to Y-DNA haplotype R1a. The Andronovo culture features the first chariots, and they had intensive copper mining and bronze metallurgy. The majority of the buildings in the Sintashta settlement had forges. They had fortified settlements, and they exported metal to the BMAC. At Sintashta, we find the first horse sacrifice, which matches the descriptions in the Rig Veda. It seems like there were two major warlike expansions of Indo-Europeans, one earlier with Yamna spreading R1b, and one later with Sintashta spreading R1a. Sintashta was likely fair-haired and fair-eyed, like the descriptions of Indra in the Rig Veda. And here are some interesting dates from the period. August 11th, 3114 BC is the start date of the Mayan calendar. February 18th, 3102 BC is the beginning of the Kali Yuga, as per the Vedas. 3100 BC, according to legend, Menes unifies Upper and Lower Egypt, and a new capital is erected in Memphis. 
3100 BC, we have the Narmer palette, which describes this unification and establishes the artistic style which will stay with the unified kingdom of Egypt over the next few thousand years. Now going back to the New World, 4500 BC in southeast Louisiana, the mound builder culture is founded, which develops into the Mississippian civilization, which featured a mythology including a skybird father and an underworld mother. By 4000 BC, we have the Old Copper Complex in the Western Great Lakes region. This is very soon after the major exploitation of copper in the Old World, which to me indicates that there have been connections between the New and Old World, which were not known by the majority of world cultures, but were known by some elite group. 3500 BC, we have the beginnings of the Norte Chico civilization in Ecuador, which led eventually to the Incas. It's interesting that the first pottery of this region, of the Valdivia culture of Ecuador, resembles contemporary Haman pottery of Japan. The Neolithic is still full of mystery. I think the one thing that it is safe to say is that there are connections between discrete geographic regions for which we do not yet have an adequate explanation. My own explanation is that found roughly outlined in my Atlantean hypothesis video with an Atlantic Paleolithic island culture, probably the Azores Islands, developing megalithic architecture, which is eventually introduced into southeastern Anatolia, found in Gobekli Tepe. The nearby Navali Chori hosted the priest class of this group, and this priest caste most likely split into factions over time and founded several civilizations and cultural groups around the world, including cultures in North and South America. The present identity of the Gobekli Tepan priest caste, in my opinion, is not that hard to discern, since according to Jewish and Muslim tradition, the patriarch Abraham lived in Ur of the Chaldeans, which is also known as Urfa Sanli Urfa, which is within sight of Gobekli Tepe. Most Westerners will think that Ur of the Chaldeans means the Mesopotamian Ur, but that is not the tradition to come down through Judaism. I realize this is a presentation that opens far more questions than it provides answers. We've now reached the end of this series on prehistory, but there is still the highly interesting task of tracing the development of the line of the true Abraham, the Gobekli Tepan patriarch, the civilization of Dilmun, modern-day Bahrain, and later the Phoenicians are especially interesting for anyone who wants to look into this for themselves. Thank you for listening, and God bless.